And so um, the way we're going to think about differential equations in the seminar is actually through the exponential map, which is an extremely natural way of thinking about differential equations. And um, the way I thought it would uh, be nice to get started is if we look at different types of exponents to really sort of get a sense of um, how useful the exponential map is, even in basic arithmetic. And so um, I mentioned last week that we have a couple of exponent, uh, exponent laws that are pretty easy to verify for just the natural numbers, right? So if we have something like a to the n, a to the n, we know that uh, you can just add the exponents to get a to the n plus n. So this is basic exponent laws. Where all the exponents are just going to be natural numbers. So <clears throat> that one's really easy to verify, right? You just write out n copies of a, n copies of a, and when you multiply them together, you get n plus n copies of a. Same thing with a to the m to the n. Multiply out n copies of this, and you get m times n copies of a. a b to the m, a to the m, b to the m, and then fractions a over b to the n. Write out multiple copies of a over b, and you just get a to the m over b to the n. So these are really, really easy proofs that you can do for the natural numbers. And um, the uh, thing that we're going to do now is we're going to take these and start looking at more and more exotic exponents, right? So the first slightly more exotic exponent that we're going to consider is a to the 0, right? What's this equal to? Well, obviously, everyone knows it's equal to 1, right? But it's always confusing for basic algebra students. Why in the world is a to the 0 equal to 1? And let's go and just first verify that a to the 0 is not 0. That's what everyone thinks it should be, right? So how do we know that a to the 0 is not 0? To see this, let's just suppose that it is 0. We're just going to do a little proof by contradiction, right? Suppose that it is 0, and suppose that this exponent law holds this first exponent law then what we have is that a to the n, where n is any natural number, can certainly be thought of as a to the, sorry, a to the 0 plus n. And if this exponent law holds, then we get a to the 0, a to the n. And now let's just suppose that a to the 0 really is 0. Then what this says is that every number would be equal to 0, if that was the case, right? Because if a to the 0 is 0, then any number a to the n would be 0 times a to the n, which is 0. So since we know there's numbers different from 0, that tells us that this is a contradiction. And a to the 0 can't be 0. equal to a to the 0 on the 
right. So that's a little demonstration that a to the 0 really is 1. Any questions on this little contradiction proof here? No? OK, good. So <clears throat> there we go. We took you know natural number exponents. And just using these exponent laws, we were able to derive you know, the slightly more exotic uh, what is a to the 0, which is no longer a natural number. Um, same deal with something like negative exponents. And I love the idea of, you know, a negative exponent because exponents, everyone has the same idea in their mind. It, it means multiply a number by itself some number of times, right? So when we see something like a to the negative 2, for example, we don't really think too much of it, right? It's just an exponent. You just multiply something by itself repeatedly, right? But if you think about this, what does it mean to multiply a by itself negative 2 times, right? Once you think about it for a microsecond, it's like, wow, that actually is kind of weird, right? Um, and so how do we define this thing? Well, we define it by, um, again, using what we know, just using these basic exponent laws, OK? And so let's go ahead and, so we're trying to answer what in the world is this thing equal, right? And so what we'll do is let's consider a to the m times a to the minus m. Okay. Then we don't know exactly what this thing equals yet, right? But we're going to go and do some algebra here and see what it, what it might equal. So in this case, we know that exponent law holds that if you multiply, say, base, you add the exponents. So let's go and do that. And so that exponent adds to 0. And so this product here is equal to 1. And now this gives us a tool that we can use for determining what a to the minus m has to equal, right? We can just divide it through by a to the m. And we get a to the minus m is just like we expected, 1 over a to the m. So now we've extended the exponent laws not just to 0, but in fact to all negative natural numbers. Oh, sorry, that's the, not sensible. To all negative integers, right? And uh, so far, things are pretty straightforward, right? I'm sure everyone's fine with these derivations. Now the next class of exponents that we need to define is uh, rational exponents, where we have a fraction in the exponent position. That's going to be related to this exponent line here. So we certainly want this exponent law to hold regardless of what type of exponent you have, right? It wouldn't make sense if we had these exponent laws for natural numbers and some other set of exponent laws for all the other numbers, right? We expect all these exponent laws to hold even for more exotic numbers. And so let's go ahead and take a look. What, what might a to the m over n represent? And so um, the way we define the uh, roots like this is we note that if we have a to the 1 over n raised to the n, what do we get? Well, we expect that this exponent law should, should hold for all exponents regardless of what type they are, right? So if that's the case, then we've got an exponent, and we're raising this whole thing to another exponent. So we should be able to multiply the exponents. Okay. And so what we notice is that, OK, the a to the 1 over n is the number you raise to the nth power to get a. And we have another name for that, right? We know that the number you raise to the nth power to get a 
that's just the end three of A, right? And so using this, we can now define this exponent, we've now defined exponents for all rational numbers, a to the m over n is really the, sorry, the nth root of a raised to the nth power. Okay. And so there we go. We, you know, in a matter of, what, 10 minutes, we extended these basic exponent laws. <coughs> we made sense of what they mean in the context of zero, in the context of negative integers, and in the context of rational exponents. So we're cruising along pretty good, right? Um, but once you get to something like an irrational exponent, now things start to get a little bit more interesting. So irrational exponents. We actually need calculus now to define the property because um, the example I give in the notes. Everyone, Fabian, do you have a copy of the notes? Have I emailed them to you? Not yet. Okay. I'll, I'll email you these notes that I'm working from. So in the notes, I talk about uh, five to the square root of two. So again. We see it's just an exponent, so everyone looks at it and says, oh yeah, yeah, five raised to you know a number. That's not not anything too exotic, right? Um, but you know, what does it mean to multiply five by itself square root of two times? You know, it's clearly uh, something that's gonna take some work to define. And so what we can do is like I said, you need calculus to do this. Um, you can think of the square root of two as a limit of rational numbers, right? So here we go. We, we know what rational exponents represent. So let's think of this square root of 2 as a limit of rational exponents. Okay. A1, that's our first approximation. 
this will be a2, this will be a3, and so, you know, as you keep going, as a keeps going to infinity, you get better and better approximations of the square root of 2. So, 5 to the square root of 2, then, is just the limit as n approaches infinity of 5 to the a n, where a n is that rational number that we're using to approximate the irrational. And I've got this set of approximations in the notes. Um, turns out, 5 to the 1, any guesses? So 5 to the 1 is 5. Um, 5 to the 14 over 10 turns out to be 9.51. 5 to the 141 over 100 turns out to be 9.67. And 5 to the 14, 14 over 1,000 turns out to be 9.73. And according to Wolfram Alpha, 5 to the square root of 2 is um, 9.73851, and so on. And so just going out to what is that, the fourth term in the sequence, we already got ourselves up to two, two decimals worth of uh, approximation, right? And so, in taking this limit, you then get an exact value of what 5 to the square root of 2 actually is. And so this, this is nice, right? Because we've now defined exponents for all possible real numbers. And you might look at this process here and say, oh, that's fine. Why, why change it? It works perfectly well, right? Um, but it turns out that this method, even though it works for defining uh, irrational powers, it actually still isn't the best way of doing it. And to make the point of why this you know, still breaks down on some level, let's take a look at something like a complex exponent. And so, um, Taylor series are basically um, a way of thinking about certain special functions as um, a polynomial with infinite degree, where you just have higher and higher polynomial terms, right? And they're extremely powerful and they're extremely useful. There's, um, I actually have a bumper sticker on my car 
that says um, Taylor series and beer are proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> it's it's a play on something that Ben Franklin said. So Ben Franklin said, um, you know, it was some long-winded thing where he said something like, uh, you know. The, the, the rain comes and it waters the grapes, and the grapes are picked by the farmer, and they lay in oak barrels and uh, produce wine that produces happiness. And this is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. So it's this long-winded thing, and he's talking about wine. So then people show it to wine is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And then the beer people caught on, and they said, that, yeah, they said, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. So I took it one step further and I said, beer and Taylor series, it are proof that God loves us. Yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. Um, and so, Taylor series are just a quote unquote infinite degree polynomial. And um, we've, all, we've all seen linear approximations before, right? So, let's consider. Uh, sine of x around the point uh, pi over 4. And that's the, the distinguished property of it, is that at A, right, so if you plug A in here, this whole term drops, and you just get the function value back, right? So at A, it's a perfect match. 
and then this linear term here gives you the exact slope that you need for that line to where the line and the curve are extremely good approximations around A. And so everyone's seen these calculations before, right? So we've got, um, if we're looking at sine around uh, pi over 4, then sine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. We also need f prime of a, which is cosine of pi over 4, also square root of 2 over 2. And from there, we can plug everything into our linear approximation. And we get that uh, this line, square root of 2 over 2, plus square root of 2 over 2 times x minus um, the point we're centering this thing around, pi over 4. That's that line that we're seeing in this diagram, that around that point a is a good approximation of the function. OK, so um, that's all well and good. Uh, but if we can do it with a line, then naturally we'd like to know, can we actually do it with a higher degree polynomial, right? And so in this diagram here, we've got, um, I don't have my pen. Uh, that same sine curve. And now instead of using uh, a, a line, we can use a quadratic approximation. So here we've got this polynomial, this um, quadratic, that again, at the point, the quadratic matches the function identically. And you can see that over this interval here, it's also a very good approximation of the function around that point. And it has some really important features that we'll talk about when the time is right. Just a couple minutes. That make the, the quadratic approximation um, even more useful and even, um, yeah, even more useful than the linear approximation. And so let's go and just take a look at how we've set this thing up. Is the quadratic approximation, we'll call it Q, is going to be set up by saying, um, let's take uh, some value A0 plus another value A1, X minus A. I want to use C's here, actually. C's to keep the A's. Um, just referring to that. So C sub 0, C sub 1, and C sub 2 times X minus A squared. And so this is a quadratic that once we determine what C0 and C1 and C2 are, this quadratic will then be the quadratic that we want to approximate uh, sign. And uh, we can you know, do this in a relatively straightforward way. Uh, let's go ahead and just, we don't know what C1 and C2 and C0 are, but let's go ahead and just uh, differentiate this thing twice for reasons that we'll see in a minute, okay? So let's consider Q prime. Sorry, Q double prime. First derivative of this thing drops. And you just have um, C1 uh, plus 2 times C, well, let's just do it. <laughs> okay, so Q prime. This thing drops, right? This thing here, we get uh, C1. And this thing here, the 2 comes down, C2, X minus A to the 1. So there's the first derivative and the second derivative. You get that thing drops. This thing, the derivative of that is going to be 1. And you end up getting 2C2 as your second derivative, right? And so now, we can use this to um, basically pair the second derivative up with the second derivative of, of the function at that point. Because that's what we want. We want a quadratic in which the second derivative of the quadratic matches the second derivative of the function, right? So what we do, this 2c2, we want this to equal the uh, second derivative of the function. So what have we got? We've got our function sine x. Let's differentiate that twice. Negative sine x, right? 
And so at our point, um, pi before, we've got uh, negative square root of root. And so what we see is that if we want this value to match this value, then we've got um, that Q double prime, which is 2C2, has to equal um, that negative square root of 2 over 2. So that C2 is equal to negative square root of 2 over 4. So we're, we're part way done, right? We know that C2 now is negative square root of 2 over 4. Um, and so um, once we have that, we can um, track down these other guys. Um, and, and it's basically just the same sort of idea, where you can just differentiate some number of times. Certain terms you're going to drop, and you, know, you can then solve for whatever coefficient that you need. Um, and I think I'll go and just uh, Um, give you guys the Taylor expansion. Not the Taylor expansion, but this uh, second degree Taylor one. Okay. And so the coefficients that you need, run through that procedure, like I said, differentiating some number of times, plugging in about three different values, you end up getting C0 is equal to um, F at A. C1 is equal to F prime at A. C2 is equal to F double prime at A over 2. And if you kept going here, the pattern would start to emerge that uh, Cn, if you're going to do an nth degree Taylor expansion, Taylor ball would be the nth derivative of f at a over n factorial. Okay, so you can go through this process of just tracking down what those c values have to be. And you find the coefficients for the nth term. The nth derivative of f at a over n factorial. And so, for our case, We've got uh, c sub 0 is f at pi over 4, which is square root of 2 over 2. c sub 1 is the first derivative uh, at pi over 4, which is also square root of 2 over 2. And then c2 is the second derivative over 2, which we saw second derivative is going to be um, negative square root of 2 over 2. And so there, we've identified those c values, and so just plugging those into a quadratic, we've got, uh, what is that? Square root 2 over 2. This coefficient times x minus a over 1, and then this coefficient, x minus 5 over 4. And that's our quadratic approximation that at the function, sorry, at, at the point A, the quadratic and the function are identical, and around A, the quadratic is a good approximation of the function rather. So, but it's not just a matter of does the curve quote unquote look like the other curve. There's actually mathematical uh, information that you have about that quadratic approximation. And as a simple example, um, we've got this quadratic approximation that we agreed. We've got our sign here. 
and here's our pi root 4. We've agreed that they're going to look really similar at this point, you know, around that point. But furthermore, take a look at this. What's the concavity of sine at that point? Concave up or concave down? Concave down, right? Um, so the second Taylor polynomial has the same concavity as the original function. And that's something that the first Taylor polynomial didn't have. That was just a straight line. So you didn't have an additional concavity. So the second Taylor polynomial has the same concavity as the function. Not only that, but there's this uh, additional feature that you have a notion of the curvature of a curve. So the curvature of a curve is what's called kappa. And the uh, formula for curvature is uh, f double prime, normal f double prime at a over uh, 1 plus f prime at a to the 3 halves. And so, let's go ahead and think back to what we talked about with the uh, quadratic polynomial. We agreed that this um, second derivative of the quadratic approximation is going to agree with the second derivative of the function, right? So, in other words, in this thing, if we replace f double prime at a with q double prime at a, it would make no difference, right? Because quadratic approximation has the same second derivative as the original function. But furthermore, this thing also has the same first derivative as the original function. So not only can we replace um, the delta, the second derivative, but we can also have 1 plus q prime at a. We plug that in there. And that would also make a difference. So a Taylor polynomial, the really useful thing about it is that not only does it give you a nice approximation that locally around that curve, the polynomial and the, and the curve look very similar, but at that point, the functions are almost identical in all the analytic senses. The same first derivative, so the same tangent, same second derivative, so they have the same concavity. Um, same first and second derivatives means that the curvature at that point is exactly the same as the original function, right? So the, the real powerful thing about Taylor series is that all these coefficients are specially determined to make sure that those functions have the same properties at that point. And so we've exchanged what is a transcendental function, a whole infinite series of terms, for a very good approximation that's just a, a, a quadratic. So that's the power of Taylor series. Any questions there? You guys love Taylor series as much as I do? You should. So let's go and just go through um, a quick little development of Taylor series in general. So not all polynomials have Taylor series, right? They have to be, um, you have to be able to differentiate them infinitely many times. So, you know, it's, it's a limited class of functions that have a full-on infinite series, but that class of functions is really, really important. So it's worthwhile to go through this development. Um, we can just pretty much do it uh, 
you know, uh, term by term, because this thing has a very special property that uh, we're going to be expanding around a, so our polynomial terms are going to be this um, x minus a to the power k. And so the nice thing about this is that uh, you'll notice that um, anytime we put a in there, infinitely many of those terms are going to drop, right? So we've got c sub 0, c1 x minus a to the 1, c2 x minus a to the 2. And so when we plug a in there, all these terms are just going to be 0. And since these terms drop, that automatically helps us then f of a has to, sorry, c naught has to be f of a. So the first Taylor coefficient then is just the value of the function at a. To get c1, we just differentiate. f prime at a is going to be, that term is going to drop. This term is just going to give us c1. This is going to give us 2c2 x minus a to the 1, plus some higher order terms that don't really matter. Because once again, we're plugging a in here. Right? We should be a. Plugging a in there, so this term drops. That term would have a minus a squared, so that's going to drop. a minus a cubed, so that's going to drop. And since all those terms drop, we see, okay, f prime of a is just going to be c1. And so let's just do um, two more coefficients. So we can see this pattern start to emerge. Um, have double prime. If we differentiate this thing twice, we'd end up getting 2c2 plus um, 3 times 2 x minus a plugging with a already, which is a minus a to the 1. 4 times 3, a minus a to the 2. And again, all those terms are up to give us 2c2. And like I said, one more derivative, we should still have to do that. Differentiating this thing 3 times is going to give us uh, 3 times 2 one times 1 C um, that should be C4 those C's are still sticking around here so 3 times 2 times 1 times C3 plus uh, 4 times 3 times 2 times C4 uh, A minus A to the 1, and then all those higher order terms, and all those terms drop to give you, oh, look at that. This is um, 3 factorial C3, right? And so what do we have? We've got C0 was equal to F of A. C1 is equal to F prime of A. C2, solving for C2, tells us we've got F double prime at A over 2. C3, we found F triple prime of A over 3 factorial. So what we have then is that each of these is really just some order derivative of F at A divided by the order of the derivative factorial, right? And so those are the uh, coefficients that we need to plug into this series to give us the appropriate Taylor expansion for F of A.
um, but the most important one, e to the x, expand it around a equal to zero, is this Taylor series right here. This is the k over k factorial. So that's the Taylor series expansion for e to the x. How many people? It's okay if you didn't know that. No. Seen You've seen it, yeah. yeah. Definitely you want to memorize that one. Um, there's a, I, I think I've told some of you guys this, there's a, a, a book, a really famous book um, by uh, Walter Rudin, and it's like every mathematician has a copy. Um, the very first sentence in the book says, this is the most important function in mathematics. <laughs> so definitely memorize that one, learn it. Um, we're going to use it extensively in this class, and it's actually what uh, this whole class is going to be based on is differential equations using this thing as the tool we use to solve them. Okay, so that's the Taylor series expansion for e to the x, expanded around a to the zero. Sine of x expanded around a equal to zero is going to be um, minus one to the k times x to the Uh, 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 1 factorial. And then cosine of x is sum from k around to a equal to 0. Sum from k equal to 0 to infinity uh, minus 1 to the k x to the 2k over 2k factorial. And all three of these formulas are actually closely related to one another. Um, e to the x actually sort of gives birth to these two functions if you look at um, e to the x with a complex exponent in the right way. So um, I think we'll leave it there for this week. Um, and uh, so remember, this is all in the spirit of trying to define ever more exotic exponents. And so that's where we're headed with this, is that these two, they're just provided for informational purposes just because they're really important. But this guy here, though, this is what we're going to use to start defining complex powers of complex numbers. So any questions? Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming. Uh, next week, I planned on bringing um, some snacks in case uh, people show up. So, um, <laughs>